Hey guys, welcome to Man Medicine, where we talk about how men can optimize their health and escape the collapsing U.S. healthcare system. I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about DIM today. So DIM is a is actually a very fascinating substance. It comes out, or it's available. It's available as a nutritional supplement, but it comes fundamentally from a number of like cruciferous vegetables, and it's a fascinating compound. Um, mainly because of its potential role in the treatment or prevention of hormone sensitive cancers, primarily in women, but also maybe men in terms of prostate cancer. So um, it, it modulates um, the metabolism of estrogen and, um, and it's because of that modulation, but also because of its binding to the androgen receptor that there's actually some reasonably good data that it might be helpful for patients that have uh, either have one of these uh, hormone sensitive cancers or maybe at risk for developing one uh, you know down the road but dim gets used a lot in the TRT world for men as a way to control bad estrogen what I hope to do by the conclusion of this video is convince you that um, one that's not true and then two you know, DIM really is not something that should be necessary in a properly formulated protocol. But I'm going to put the information out there for you. Obviously, as always, let you you decide what you want to do. Um, you know, at the end of the day, I think you know the chances of you harming yourself with DIM is pretty low. So uh, certainly, even after after this talk, if you still want to go out and try it, or your physician recommends you give it a try, you know, I don't have strong objections about that. But I don't think it's necessary, uh, and I'm going to explain to you guys why. So, what the heck is DIM? DIM is diindolyl methane, <laughs> D-I-M, and this chart here explains basically how it's how it's created in your body. So, it comes from a whole family of cruciferous vegetables. I'll, I'll give you the list uh, with the amounts in it here shortly, and it is converted into this indole three carbonyl, and then you know, by an enzyme that usually comes actually in the vegetable itself. And then in the in the stomach, when it's exposed to acid, this indole three carbonyl is converted into DIM, and then DIM obviously goes out into the systemic circulation. Not surprisingly, the highest levels of DIM, after you take, let's say a DIM capsule or tablet, uh, or you eat a bunch of Brussels sprouts, um, the liver has the highest levels because first pass metabolism through the gut, everything goes through the liver first, and then it accumulates in various tissues where it, you know it has its various effects. So, so that is dim. This is a list of veggies here that, um, and their relative content of, of dim. So you can see up here the biggest one is Brussels sprouts, 104 milligrams per 44 grams, which is half a cup. Um, Despite my best efforts to ban Brussels sprouts in my house, they continue to show up, um, and um, there's nothing I can do about that, unfortunately. But uh, I am happy to see that kale, uh, red cabbage, broccoli, horseradish, cauliflower, things I actually do like, also have you know a fair amount of dim in there. So I don't recommend that you take dim supplements, but by all means, these are very healthy vegetables to include in your diet and you can get some dim that way. So don't buy dim at GNC, just eat dim by eating more of these vegetables. That, that's my approach with, with dim. Now, um, the, the amount of dim and the amount that's absorbed, obviously it varies from vegetable to vegetable, but, um, but cooking them can also decrease it uh, as well. So you know it's probably better if you eat these things raw. What are some of the claims about DIM? There's stuff, all kinds of stuff on the internet about DIM, mainly from people that sell it. Okay, um, this is uh, this is well. Let's watch a little video here. This is my favorite. <laughs> this is my favorite YouTube chiropractor telling us a little bit about DIM. Let's see what he has to say. Hi, I'm back. In this video, we're going to talk about a substance called DIM, men and estrogen. Now, I had a question about DIM, which basically is a compound that helps the metabolism of estrogen. It helps to balance estrogen. And mainly people think of women having estrogen or, or estrogen dominance, so that's why they take it. But it's also good for men in certain situations. Now there are two pathways that deal with estrogen in the liver. Okay, To make it really simple and non-complex, one increases estrogen, the other decreases estrogen. Okay, So DIM helps you decrease the bad estrogen in the liver. 
So it's very, very important for that. Now here's a challenge. As a male body ages, it starts to accumulate more estrogen. They become estrogen dominant. They get um, breast tissue, uh, lowered testosterone, because testosterone and estrogen kind of work as a teeter-totter, um, prostate enlargement, urination issues, they lose body hair. So there's all these things that can happen. Uh, higher voice. So now the question is, where does this estrogen come from? Now it could come from the environment, it could come from the food that you're eating, but it also could come from your own body because your fat cells make estrogen. So the fatter you are, the more estrogen you're going to make. So it's really important to get on the ketosis, get on the intermittent fasting to lose the weight to help balance this estrogen situation because if you lower estrogen, your testosterone will go up naturally. But typically what happens is an enzyme that's converting this testosterone to estrogen as well in your body and DIM blocks that enzyme. So it helps to balance this, these two hormones. So basically DIM will support healthy estrogen levels as well as healthy testosterone levels. I put a link down below. Okay, so what he just said is uh, it's almost like everywhere I go on the internet, some of these, the things that he just said are repeated over and over again. And some of those things are, um, it helps balance estrogen, okay? It lowers bad estrogen, it raises good estrogen. So you, you hear these catchphrases a lot. Um, he's incorrect about a couple things here. You know, he says it blocks the conversion of testosterone to, to estrogen, or presumably he means estradiol. Um, no, no, that, so that's the aromatase enzyme. DIM does not act as an aromatase inhibitor. Uh, it's got a totally different mechanism, so he's totally wrong about that. Um, but anyway, I don't wanna give him too hard of a time, but what he's talking about here, you know, you, you see these catchphrases, balancing estrogen, balancing testosterone, um, good estrogen, bad estrogen. So let, let's get into that a little bit. This is how estrogen or estradiol is metabolized in the body. All right, so let's start here. We have 17 beta estradiol. And so I highlighted in green uh, and then in red the four major metabolites that I want to talk about. Now, all of these are important, okay? There, there are no such things as good estrogen. If they're made by your body, I'm not talking about environmental estrogens. If it's made by your body, there's no such thing as a good estrogen or a bad estrogen, all right? Mother Nature and evolution has created this very complicated system so that all of these, all of these different variants of, of all these different metabolites of estradiol, they perform a function and they exist in specific quantities um, for the purpose of optimizing your health. So there's no such thing as good and bad estro estrogen, all right? So 17 beta estradiol, it gets converted into 17 beta estrone. Uh, it does not typically get converted back the other way. Um, it's, it's, that's, that's a one way, it should be a one way arrow there. You can see the other arrow is kind of small, which means the reverse reaction is, uh, it's very difficult. So the green ones here, there's two hydroxy esterone and uh, two hydroxy estradiol. These are considered, they call these the good estrogens only because they bind very weakly to the estradiol receptor, okay? They, they have a lower affinity for the receptor than these ones in red, 16 alpha hydroxyesterone and four hydroxyestrogens. So those have a, a very high binding affinity. So in many ways, you can think of these two green ones here as estrogen antagonists. So they bind, you know, very loosely, but they don't, they don't tend to activate the receptor and when they're present in higher higher amounts, you know, they do occupy the receptor to some extent and potentially inhibit the activity of these more potent uh, red uh, est estrogen metabolites. So, which they, they call the bad estrogens, but they're not. They're, there's, they're both good, they're all good. <laughs> there's, there's no bad estrogens, okay? So I think this gets perpetuated. It, there has been this just pervasive myth and it's, you know, it is slowly getting better that that estrogen in men is bad. And I hope you guys have listened to my content long enough and, and, and there are a lot of other physicians that you can see on YouTube and other places that talk about this, but estrogen is extraordinarily beneficial for men. Um, many of the benefits from testosterone replacement therapy that you think you're getting from testosterone, 
like fat loss, libido, et cetera, are actually coming from the aromatization of testosterone into estradiol and all of its metabolites that we just talked about there. So the, you got to get over this estrogen phobia and you, you got to get over this notion that you need to do something about your, you need to take something for your estrogen. Well, I'm taking testosterone, so I have to take you know, Arimidex or some other, I have to take Tamoxifen or I have, maybe I have to take DIM. And I see it all the time, you know, they, guys will acknowledge that, okay, okay, fine, you know, um, anastrozole is, is bad for you, I'm not gonna take it. But here's this stuff called DIM, I'll, I'll just take DIM because it's, it's all natural, right? So and th that'll help me with my estrogen. You know, the, and, and they just can't grasp the fact that you don't need to do that. You just don't need to do that, except in extraordinarily rare cases do you need to mess around with, um, with your estrogen levels. If you have a properly formulated testosterone protocol and you address your underlying lifestyle issues and you address your visceral body fat, the estrogen will take care of itself. What's my estradiol level? I have no idea because I don't check it because I don't care. Now, I have checked it just out of curiosity in the past and it varies it's all over the map. So when I get really, really lean, like when I get down to seven, eight percent body fat, my um, estrogen level has been as low as 14. When the holidays roll around and I get a little, little fluffier, it's been as high as 60. I felt way better when it was 60. Now that might have been just because I was eating more calories. Uh, I was actually being pretty strict on my diet when I was when I was really low. But you know, regardless, I, I really didn't feel all that different. So I don't check it because I don't care. You know, and there, there's guys are just obsessed with their estrogen numbers, and I, and I just um, I, I try to like talk them off the ledge about it. It's just not that important. You know, you may want to know about it early on in your therapy, but as time goes on and once you get dialed in, it's just not that important. You know, it's just not that important. So there's <laughs> there's a phrase that we learned in in, in medical school, uh, and it it comes from this book. It's called "The Real Doctor Will See You Shortly." And it's about like this poor young guy's first year, I think as an intern, and he's he's kind of getting, a, he's being shown the ropes by like one of the senior surgical residents. And he's just basically telling them how to survive. And there's a phrase in there or a quote, he says, when you can eat, eat, when you can sleep, sleep, and then you insert something else that I'm not gonna say. Uh, then he goes, but do not fuck with the pancreas. <laughs> it's totally true, you should not fuck with the pancreas. but. I don't think you should fuck with estrogen either. You know, it's it's just not necessary. The um, you, you're if you're doing if you're doing things correctly, your estrogen will take care of itself. Unless you're some weird genetic outlier, um, or you are just morbidly obese, and you know you need something in the short run. In general, your estradiol will take care of itself. Uh, don't obsess about it. You don't need to take um, you don't need to take some additional substance to mo you know modulate or balance or quote you know like they say you don't you don't need to balance your estrogen levels with with anything your your body wants to be in balance it will self balance if you are doing the right things so what does it do here now the most of the studies on dim are in in postmenopausal and premenopausal women there's a few in guys that we'll talk about here in just a second but um, the the anti cancer properties of dim have a lot to do with altering that ratio between those highly potent estrogens, the ones in red, and the green ones that are a little bit less potent and have a lower binding affinity for the estradiol receptor. So if you look at the ratio, the ratio of 2-hydroxyesterone to, to 16-hydroxyesterone, uh, so, and presumably this applies to estradiol too, but if you look at 2-hydroxyesterone, to 16 alpha hydroxyesterone, um, a normal ratio in a in a postmenopausal woman is about 2.3. A ratio less than two is potentially a higher risk for one of these pro pro hormone proliferative cancers, like breast cancer, or maybe cervical cancer. And DIM seems to change that ratio. So in women whose ratio is less than two, there's some studies here um, that show it can go. Uh, you can shift that ratio above two, which presumably would put them at lower risk. And that comes from this study here. In this case, they were looking at, at thyroid disease. So it's from the journal Thyroid uh, from 2011. 
And that's exactly what they found. They gave them 300 milligrams of DIM per day for 14 days, and they found a, a what they call a favorable change in this ratio of um, of estrogen metabolites. So, but that's in women. So you know, there, there's no evidence that changing this ratio in men does anything at all. So. Again, it's, DIM is fascinating. I think it's a really interesting substance. And again, I, I, I think it has potential to be something like potentially really important in the cancer world in women, but not so much in guys, especially not otherwise healthy guys who are on TRT. So are there any, you know, what are the effects on men? Well, we don't really know. There's, I'll get into a few things here, but there's, there's not a whole lot out there on men. There is some concern about maybe affecting fertility in men, but we don't know for sure. This study here in Andrologia, my favorite journal, um, looked at the effects of DIM on the reproductive system in rats. So, you know, it's an animal study, so take it for what it's worth. Um, this is a 2016 article, and they found some actually kind of unfavorable effects on the rat testicle and on sperm number, motility, and morphology. And they thought that it was related to this MDA stuff, which is a, uh, a pro-oxidant substance that they thought may have caused uh, free radical damage within the testicle itself. So what did they say here? They said that um, DIM led to a decrease in sperm motility and live sperm rates were significantly decreased in all treatment groups when compared to the control group. So again, an animal study, I uh, could not find anything um, online uh, that showed similar effects uh, in men. Uh, I couldn't find any studies, period, uh, looking at this. But it's something to consider. You know, if, if, um, if, if fertility is a, is a big issue for you, you may want to consider staying away from, from DIM. Um, what does it do to testosterone? Because um, this is something you hear too, it balances testosterone, okay. Well, here's some information from this really interesting study, a Journal of uh, Biological Chemistry. This is dated um, 2003. Plant-derived DIM is a strong androgen antagonist in human prostate cancer cells. So it turns out that DIM binds to the androgen receptor and it has a number of effects which could well they could potentially be favorable if you have prostate cancer but they could also be potentially unfavorable if you're otherwise healthy male on testosterone therapy so so what does this study show it says th this is really interesting this study was the first to reveal that a dim suppresses dht induced cell growth and psa expression okay the, so that might be good if you have uh, a prostate issue, potentially, and exhibits no androgen receptor uh, agonist activity. So it does not activate the androgen receptor. So when it binds to it, it doesn't activate it, okay? Okay, B, DIM has a strong affinity for both the mutant AR um, in, L in LNC LNCA prostate cancer cells and for wild type AR. Okay, so that just means that it may um, it may be useful in um, you know, prostate cancer cells that have a mutant androgen receptor. Now this is also really interesting. It says nuclear translocation and foci formation of DHT bound AR androgen receptors are inhibited by DIM. Okay, this is a big one. So the androgen receptor binds to androgens like dihydrotestosterone and then, which is within the cell. And then it has to be transported inside the nucleus of the cell where it binds to your DNA and then, you know, leads to DNA transcription. Well, DIM inhibits that. And that's not good. That's not good if you're an otherwise healthy male. You want, your, you want DHT to be able to work and you want testosterone to be able to work. And it has to bind the androgen receptor and then it has to make its way into the nucleus in order to do what it's supposed to do. And DIM according to this study, appears to block that to a certain extent. Modeling studies show that DIM is remarkably similar in molecular geometry and surface charge distribution to the well-established synthetic anti-androgen Casodex. I haven't used or heard about Casodex in a very, very long time, but Casodex is a, uh, a very potent drug used in, in metastatic prostate cancer that blocks the androgen receptor. So it's, it's uh, a lot of times it's used in dual therapy. So, you know, a man who has metastatic prostate cancer will be chemically castrated with a GnRH agonist 
and then also given Casadex, so the androgen receptor. So any like residual androgen that's floating around, like from the adrenal glands, is is also blocked at that level. So um, so DIM acts like a very potent androgen receptor blocker that's used in the chemical castration of men who have metastatic prostate cancer. There you go. So um, that sounds a little concerning. I don't, I'm not sure I want to sign up for that. Okay. Now, again, if you have prostate cancer, that might be something that's good. But I don't know. That, if you're otherwise healthy, the, this is a red flag to me. Okay. The other thing that gets said about DIM a lot is that it lowers SHBG. Okay. And they're like, oh, well, this, you know, this is part of the testosterone balancing thing because obviously if you lower SHBG, then maybe your free testosterone will go up. This is another thing that guys obsess about in addition to estrogen levels is their SHBG. You go on the forums and they're always talking about tinkering around with SHBG and oh, maybe I'll take some boron to do that. I can use oxandrolone and, you know, this and that, you know, again, stop trying to F around with SHBG. I, I just, you know, there's... There's a way to address high, high SHBG. And I'm gonna, with the caveat that if you're an otherwise completely healthy guy, you don't have liver disease, there's a number of things that can cause SHBG elevation as well as depression that are pathological. And I'm gonna talk about those, I think, in a different video. But if you're an otherwise healthy guy with a high SHBG level, um, there's a way to handle that. And you know what that is? It's more testosterone. You just up the testosterone dose. Um, I have no idea what my SHBG level is. I haven't looked at it in in probably seven or eight years. Because you know what? I don't care. I just care about my free testosterone level, and I can infer you know what my SHBG level is. But you know the truth is I don't really care. It's just a yet another number that you know guys get obsessive about, and they don't need to. So maybe DIM does affect S SHBG. I actually couldn't find any solid studies that definitively showed it had a, you know, a reproducible effect in, in terms of lowering SHBG. But even if it does, who cares? Who cares? Okay, if you're on TRT and you have a low free T, the, the, the answer is not DIM, it's not necessarily boron or any or oxandrolone, you know, Anivar, any of this stuff that you hear people talk about, it's just, just up your testosterone dose. You'll saturate the SHBG and one of the most potent suppressants of SHBG is testosterone. It'll, it will come down. It will come down if you just have to increase your testosterone level. So again, just stop trying to outsmart your body. Your body's your body's is clever. Don't don't you try to be clever. Just just stick to the basics. All right. Are there any risks? Not really. I mean, dim is dim is pretty darn safe, um, especially if you take it in reasonable doses. Now. It does get broken down by the cytochrome P450 system, which any of you medical school students out there, you were tortured with the cytochrome P450 system, especially the CYP1A2 enzyme. So there's a number of different drugs that you used to have to memorize that are also metabolized by the same cytochrome P450. And so you, know, you have to be careful about prescribing multiple drugs, right, that are broken down by the same cytochrome because you know then you can have abnormal you know potentially toxic levels of these prescription drugs so um you know there's there are a handful of drugs that you maybe need to be a little bit careful with if you're taking dim they're mainly like antipsychotics antidepressants um muscle relaxers like flexoril um is one of them uh plavix which is a very potent antiplatelet drug you'd have to be i, I probably would not take dim if I was on Plavix, that, that seems kind of risky. I see a lot of unfortunate bleeding episodes from Plavix, uh, many of which are devastating. Uh, I see those in the emergency room. So, um, so other than that, I mean, it's it's pretty darn safe. And that's why, you know, I don't have a ton of heartburn. If, if you want to try DIM, and you know what, if you tell me that DIM makes you feel better, then I'm like, you know what, buddy, you go for it, you take your DIM. It's, you know, it's just a, an additional cost that, you know, in my opinion, at least the data doesn't support the fact that, you know, men routinely need something like this added into their testosterone regimen. You know, getting back to the estrogen thing, I mean, if you think about it, you know, when, when you were in your prime, when you were like 18, 19, 20 years old, and, you know, who knows, I don't know what your testosterone level was then, but it was probably pretty darn good. Um, you know, did, did you need to take things to control your estrogen then? No. 
Uh, and in fact, I bet if you had checked your estradiol levels back when you were 17, 18, 19, they were probably high, like over 50, all right? That's part of the reason you felt so good. So, you know, if you didn't need an astrazole or dim when you were 17 and 18, chasing girls and playing football or whatever you were doing, you know, why do you need it now at age 40 with the same testosterone level? And the answer is you don't. You do need to address your visceral body fat, you need to clean up your lifestyle, you need to limit your exposure to endocrine disrupting compounds. That's, yeah, that goes without saying, but do you need to take this other substance, you know, for, for you know, potentially for the rest of your life to, you know, balance your estrogen? In my opinion, I don't think you do. I don't think you do. So to wrap things up, um, you know, uh, don't F with estrogen. You know, your body has these mechanisms and it makes these metabolites for a reason. There are no good or bad estrogens. They, are, they all exist for a purpose. And if you want to balance your estrogen level, you need to one, be on a, you want to, you want to be on a good protocol uh, for your testosterone therapy. And like I've said a thousand times on this channel, don't be fat. You got to get your visceral body fat down. You have to limit your endocrine disrupting compounds and you need to live as healthy a lifestyle as you possibly can. All right, guys, that's all I got for you today on DIM. Like I said, if you want to try it, it's up to you. I don't have any major, major issues with you trying it. If, you, um, if, if you've tried DIM in the past and you've had either good or negative experience from it, let me know in the comments. I personally have never tried DIM. I'm not interested in it. I don't think I need it and I'm, I will probably never try it. But um, a lot of guys have, and if you're one of them, let me know. I'm, I'm totally curious about it. And, um, and um, leave those in the comments, and I will talk to you guys next time. Does it any kind? including the giving of medical advice. I am not your doctor. No doctor-patient relationship has been established. This content is not meant to be a substitute for professional medical advice and should not be relied upon solely for that purpose either. The only purpose of this content is to present peer-reviewed, research-backed health information for your consideration. As always, rely on the advice and guidance of your personal physician before undertaking any activity presented here, and if in doubt or not comfortable with said activity, practice discretion. Your health is your responsibility and not ours. Finally, I take conflicts of interest seriously. I accept no compensation whatsoever from any private corporations, including pharmaceutical or supplement companies. You can trust that if I recommend a medication, product, or service, it's because I genuinely believe in it and not because I'm being paid to endorse it.